Um, so welcome to the second day of um, the uh, annual Philippine Studies Conference. And today we are the, doing our second keynote. Um, uh, Dr. Una Paredes is um, a native of Misamis Oriental province. And she just moved to the US to take up, a, moved back to the US to take up um, an assistant professorship at UCLA. Uh, uh, with the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures. Um, she's an anthropologist by training. Her field research focuses on Higaunun Lumads of Northern Mindanao. So, uh, welcome. <laughs> she's Visaya. If, uh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Gibasa lang man mong description. Oh. Okay. Um, Hi, good morning, <laughs> everyone. I'm kind of hoping that you haven't completely sobered up from last night, so this might be a little more fun. Um, yeah, so I wanted to begin by greeting you, Madagwaya Adao, which is a greeting from the Higaonon Lumad, uh, people with whom I do my research in Northern Mindanao. Um, I wanted to thank the organizers, especially Christina Juan and Soas, for conducting this annual Philippine Studies Conference, and thanks especially for the memo to you know, make sure the keynote speakers have the same haircut and glasses. So, um, <laughs> he's not here though, so I, that joke falls flat. Uh, so I'm I'm really honored to be part of this conference, um, especially considering the quality and diversity of scholarship being presented, while also break, breaking out of what I consider the cliquish um, tendencies. Uh, of any area studies endeavor, especially Philippine studies, where you see the same faces over and over again. There are many people here who I've never met before, which to me is just a hallmark of a really, you know, great, potentially great conference. Um, this morning I'd like to talk a bit about the ways in which we construct and deconstruct Mindanao and Mindanaoans uh, through our research and discuss some of the myriad um, possible directions and other considerations for future research that I hope you will agree are worthwhile. Um, my comments will reflect issues that I've encountered in the process of my own research and teaching and in previous conferences, as well as some of the issues raised in yesterday's presentations and Q&As, um, as well as the exciting presentations lined up for today. Um, when I was asked uh, initially to give a title for my keynote, I gave the title Becoming Mindanao, Becoming Mindanao, um, narratives of placemaking and people making over the centuries. Um, and I, I came up with that in part because of the title of the conference, the Cartographies of History, Identity, and Representation. Um, in pluralizing cartographies, the conference title embodies a fundamental reality of historical, uh, political, anthropological, and other types of academic research, not just on Mindanao, but on any place that that there can be multiple ways of representing and interpreting something. In Mindanao's case, we can say, based on yesterday's papers, papers alone, that there are many ways of imagining Mindanao as a place and conceptualizing it within different contexts of study, whether it's viewed through an anthropological, historical, political, or other lens. Um, and this same imagining applies to its people as well, its peoples. And I speak of all people of Mindanao, not just its indigenous Lumad um, and Moro peoples, as we refer to them broadly today. Um, so as, as we here in this room have studied this particular special spot in the world over the decades, um, it behooves us to broach several questions like, what is Mindanao? And who is Mindanao? Um, but beyond this, what about where is Mindanao? And perhaps even more provocatively, when is Mindanao? We already know that our answers depend on where we are standing and the direction from which we're gazing at this particular subject across time and space. Um, uh, this is the part we as scholars contribute um, to what I like to call placemaking and people making. The other part is, of course, contributed by the places and peoples relative to Mindanao that are the subjects of our study. The Lumads, for example, have their own distinct ways of placemaking and people making, as do colonial functionaries, religious missionaries, and others. Um, when, when people hear the word Mindanao, it can call up any number of mental images. 
uh, some of which were presented yesterday. So today, it's anywhere from a violent, lawless dystopia from which a strong man like Duterte emerged. Um, it could be a hotbed of terrorism and armed rebellion, with or without links to international networks. Um, it's also the underdeveloped political and civilizational frontier of Filipino national consciousness, um, or a land of unfulfilled promise, as it was called in the edited volume um, by Mark Turner, RJ May, and Lulu um, Respal Turner from some decades ago. Um, but historically, Mindanao was also many places. Um, it was a trade entrepot or tributary of China and the land below the winds. It was a far eastern um, outpost of the Islamic Ummah um, at the periphery of Nusantara. It's uh, several distinct leaves or branches in the larger tree of the Malay world uh, with reference to a Leonard and Dias work. Um, it's, uh, its people in turn belong to not just the Malay world but to also to the broader Austronesian linguistic and cultural family to which most peoples of island Southeast Asia belong. Now, much later in history, um, Mindanao represented the outer limits of Spanish colonial authority and political influence, what I refer to in my book as a pericolonial space. That is to say, it was still affected by the colonial experience, by the colonial presence, though it was not under much direct colonial governance, except for certain slivers of the coastline to use Spain's own regretful description of their political reach with regard to the island. Um, as such, it was casually excluded from serious consideration in the authoritative 1959 book on the Hispanization of the Philippines by the Americanist um, historian John Letty Phelan. Because in his view, nothing of note really happened there as far as Hispanization is concerned. Though from my, my more recent um, ethno-historical research, we now know that this characterization is not accurate. Um, and that there was a cultural and political impact on the indigenous peoples of Mindanao. Just that its outcome looked quite different from what happened in the northern islands um, of the archipelago that were more, more closely incorporated by the colonial powers. Um, and from more nuanced, nuanced um, studies of missionization, um, it becomes, Mindanao becomes one of the bright lines demarcating the Christian and Muslim worlds within the Catholic imagination of the colonial Spanish and Portuguese. And one might argue also post-colonially in the Filipino and Western imagination, that it's a dividing line. Um, but one thing that seems most consistent in all these images we have of Mindanao is its placement at the periphery of different cultural, religious, and political cores. Um, in this sense, studying Mindanao is, is, uh, can feel very much like studying what Anna Singh refers to with regard to central Borneo as marginality in an out-of-the-way place. Um, Interestingly enough, in contrast to that, almost all the papers here uh, in this conference are about how connected and embedded Mindanao actually and its people actually are, especially historically, with the rest of the region and the rest of the world. Um, in fact, this was the thrust of a recent panel at the AAS in Asia conference in Bangkok um, the other day led by scholars from Davao, such as Anderson Villa and um, John Harvey Gamas, and we're the Ateneo people here. Um, anyway, um, so what I'd like to do then is think about recentering Mindanao and, and place it as a core for a change instead of a periphery. And there's much we can, we can do here, uh, because from where I stand, there's much more to Mindanao than most people currently imagine. Um, and definitely much more than the vagaries of national and nationalist politics, um, of so-called Islamic terrorism and the illicit and illegal movement of guns, drugs, and people and other sexy topics. Okay, so there's more, there's more. My concern here is in representing Mindanao more completely and more holistically in terms of dedicated academic scholarship. Um, in large part, this is because I'm, I'm from there. And to me personally, it's, it's the most beautiful, fascinating place in the world, um, warts and all. Uh, it's, it's home to me and it's the place where my heart always feels like returning to whenever I get sick and tired of this world, which lately is with Trump is, you know, quite often. So I mean, one can say I take scholarship on Mindanao somewhat personally, and I don't want it misrepresented, romanticized, or dystopianized, um, at least not in, in terms of serious scholarship. Um, yesterday, the keynote showed that Mindanao cannot be 
seen in black and white terms and that there are a lot of gray areas. And in fact, maybe all of it is gray. Um, and that is a fair representation. It, it would be true of any, uh, pretty much any place in the world and not just Mindanao. And it's perhaps the essence of true scholarship uh, to be able to portray the many different grays about a place, uh, about a people, about a situation. Um, but at the risk of going a bit overboard with the uh, color spectrum metaphor here, um, I would argue that we can go further and study Mindanao in technicolor. Um, because in reality, acknowledging the nuances or gray areas of a thing um, is but the first step in producing solid, verifiable scholarship and achieving some form of empiricism. Seeing the grays is only the beginning. And I think we can definitely do more. Um, so centering Mindanao for me is an argument for studying it as productively as possible in terms of scholarly output for individual scholars, but also um, in terms of groundbreaking scholarship. Uh, we cannot break new ground if we remain caught up in the same old arguments over and over with regard to Mindanao's place within the Philippines. Um, we can break out of that and center Mindanao. And among the many contexts of when and where we could center Mindanao include um, centering it in pre-colonial or early modern Southeast Asia and the Malay world, and, and, and dispensing with the idea of the inevitability of the Philippines historically. Okay? It was never inevitable that there would be a Philippines. Um, and we could center it in the prehistoric Austronesian world, in the Islamic world, um, possibly even in the earlier Indian uh, Hindu Buddhist world, um, and today in post-colonial Southeast Asia, of course, and in the Spanish colonial period and Christian missionization, which um, in my reckoning extends to the construction of Filipino national identity, its evolution up to today. Um, and there's also much we could contribute when we center Mindanao in its own right within both Southeast Asian studies, where I, where I come from, and Asian studies as distinct bodies of area scholarship, um, as well as within the disciplinary boundaries of social sciences and humanities and their respective theoretical frameworks on a global scale. We can globalize Mindanao very easily. Um, last but not least, we should also ask ourselves as scholars of the Philippines, whether it is most productive to study Mindanao within Philippine studies or outside of it. Um, personally, part of what appealed to me so strongly about this particular conference is that we could talk about Mindanao here largely free of the national and nationalist concerns of Philippine studies, which I think bog us down um, as Mindanao scholars. Um, I've seen one too many conferences, been to one too many conferences where all the papers pertaining to Mindanao, despite being unrelated to each other, are stuffed into one, lumped together into a peripheral panel labeled something like Mindanao issues. Um, while panel after panel of all sorts of papers on national politics are arrayed in the schedule. And I'm, I'm frankly tired of that. I think it's unproductive for us who study Mindanao. Um, in terms of possible narratives, since that's the title of my um, keynote, um, there are also multiple perspectives and positionalities to consider here, um, as well as the interactions over time between these various perspectives and positionalities. For example, we have um, those we call Lumads today, um, and they're, they're, maps of, they're maps of Mindanao, since we're talking cartographies here, right? Their maps of Mindanao consist of rivers of history, as I like to call it. They have place-linked genealogies, oral histories of colonial contact, experiences of post-colonial incursion, um, and shared expressions of political resistance today uh, through environmentalism, indigeneity, and the active assertion of Filipino citizenship. Um, and this is the population I study, and I can talk more about this if anyone is interested. I could talk for hours about this. Um, for those we now call Moros, including those who do not wish to be labeled Moros, um, they have comparable histories of early forms of statehood, um, international relations, um, conquest both as conquerors and conquered, um, different fights over sovereignty and autonomy, um, and the mod their modern struggle over identity and citizenship as well. Um, and this includes those with a strong Muslim identity as well as those moral groups who are based in, for example, maritime environments and don't strongly identify as Muslims. Um, you also have other Filipinos, you have settlers, both early and more recent, um, including those who now regard themselves as Mindanaoan, um, even though their ancestors might not be indigenous to Mindanao. 
Uh, you also have the foreigners who have visited or migrated to Mindanao over the centuries, Chinese, Japanese, Americans, Spaniards, various missionaries, Indonesians, Arabs. I hear that Indians are the largest immigrant population in Davao City today. Uh, what does their narrative of Mindanao look like? What will it look like 50 years from now? Um, as to my perspective and my positionality as someone from Mindanao, for those of you who don't know me, um, most of you don't know me, so um, I grew up in a Visayan family whose ancestors have been in Mindanao um, since the late 1700s uh, based on missionary baptismal records. Um, possibly earlier as one of our family names, Awitan, is according to my Higaonon Lumad informants, an indigenous or Lumad name, but I think they're just sort of trying to be nice to me and make me feel like, making me feel like I belong. Um, but I also have significant ancestry from migrant foreigners, um, Ch Chinese and American and Spanish, um, and from Filipinos in the north. Um, for example, one, uh, well, uh, one ancestor of mine was killed um, by pirates in a coastal raid uh, in the mid-1800s. Um, and that ancestor's daughter uh, vividly remembered hearing the eruption of Krakatoa and hearing about the execution of Jose Rizal as a child. Um, when, when she was a child, not when Jose Rizal was a child, obviously. Um, another ancestor left his uh, first family in, uh, behind in southern China and migrated to Mindanao, converted to Catholicism, and became a trader of goods with various mountain folk. Um, yet another um, ancestor escaped a Japanese POW camp um, and helped coordinate MacArthur's return to the Philippines from a mountainside in Kamigin. While my story my narrative is not as potentially representative of the Mindanao experience as the theoretical Muslim woman with the surname Tan from yesterday's um, keynote. It is nonetheless a narrative of Mindanao, uh, one that is equally true and equally colorful um, and equally informative in terms of what we can know about Mindanao as a place and as a maker of people. Um, after all, it is our task as scholars I, I believe, um, as scholars of this out-of-the-way place, not to simplify our understanding of Mindanao, uh, but to instead complicate it. Now, how do we do this? Uh, besides pressing on, of course, with the interesting and innovative scholarship uh, we already are engaged in undertaking, as evidenced by the papers in this um, conference. Um, well, I'm an anthropologist and ethnohistorian, so I will focus here primarily on our cultural understanding of the past. Since many of us here um, study the past in various capacities, I figured it would be the most um, pertinent uh, approach to address. Um, so, get a drink first. Our studies um, of the past, I think, should not just be about an understanding of our history but also about grasping more fully um, the, uh, for lack of a better word, texture of this history and its respective landscape. Um, beyond constructing the where and when of Mindanao, um, there is much more texture that we can bring to light here. And what do I mean by, by texture? I mean the details that make the history real and not just imagined. Uh, you know, and, and to some extent uh, also the pastness of this past, you know, uh, drawing from what T.S. Eliot first came up with and, and com which comes into social sciences through Trio. Um, so some parenthetical examples from my research. Some of you might find kind of silly or not, but just as my own personal experience as a researcher, um, when I first started doing archival research, I read several Spanish accounts of Moros repeatedly burning down the, the forts Spanish forts at Tamontaca as well as Caraga in the early 1600s. And this always puzzled me, although it did not surprise me because um, you also read a lot of references to forts being burned down in novels of early America, like the Last of the Mohicans types of novels. Hey. Um, and so, but it took a while for me to get that my concept of fort was limited to my own experience um, of, say, Fort Santiago in Tremuros and other stone forts that have survived the centuries and have become um, museums, essentially, today. Uh, naturally, 
That was my understanding of fort. But Spanish forts back in the early colonial period were ostensibly made of wood, not stone. And it took me a really long time to, to get this, years, okay? And, and thus, they could, they, they, thus they could be set on fire um, and burned to the ground by raiding, raiding natives. Um, why is something like this relevant? Um, because it influences radically our understanding of the materiality of this history and how certain things could have been possible. Um, it, it demythologizes it, it demystifies it, um, and it helps us understand how, for one, um, how the Moros were able to keep the Spaniards at bay for so long, and as well as the limits, the material limits of Spanish power at the time. Um, in another example, I mean, you have also the um, landscape of interaction um, in both coastal and interior areas of Mindanao that for centuries did not correspond in any way to the current transportation infrastructure that structures our experience of Mindanao today. Um, it becomes crucial to understanding, um, to understand this historical landscape um, in order for us to understand how, for example, Lumad populations in the interiors of Agusan, Misamis, and Caraga were subject to the influence and political control of Maguindanaos and Maranaos and not the coastal Spaniards. When, if you look at the map of Mindanao today, it seems impossible to imagine how a raiding party from Maguindanao or even Lanao could be a realistic war threat when, when it seems like it would take surely take days to get from the western half of Mindanao to the eastern half, crossing all those mountains. But, um, but not back then, um, as Lanao is... I mean, it learned from field research just a few hours brisk hike to Cagayan in Misamis through the interior. And somebody coming from Caraga could cross into the interior and make it all the way to Lanao. Um, so, you know, there's, there's that. Um, we, we think of Lumads today um, as being upland peoples, but some of their oral histories are about their migration from the coastal areas, which again changes radically our understanding of these peoples. Um, at the same time, their histories and genealogies are written all across the landscape um, of Mindanao in terms of the burials of traceable ancestors and in terms of legendary ancestors. Uh, it, it's, this history is traced um, across the landscape um, in the mountains from which these ancestors emerged and into which they were raptured into, into the heavens. Um, speaking of legendary ancestors, um, there are references in Higaonon and Manobo oral traditions of what they describe as upturned saucers called the Salimbal um, in Higaonon narratives um, that some ancestors used for travel. Uh, um, in some cases, they traveled to Manila on these upturned saucers or shields. Um, in some cases, they traveled to heaven in these, in these legendary, um, uh, the legendary ancestors uh, did. Um, in the Epic of Agu, for example, studied most extensively by the late Elena Makizo, and which is shared across the Man all the Manobo language groups, almost all the Manobo language groups, Agu, Agu and his magical relatives are lifted into a gigantic salimbal or saucer by a chain pulled by a shiny deity. Now, lest you start thinking of spaceships and flying saucers here, um, this is likely what a Spanish ship on the northern coast of Mindanao would have looked like to a Higaonon or Manobo viewing it from the mountains at a great distance. Um, does, that, does that not alter our understanding of these people and their pastness? Uh, to me, it does. Um, one more thing about oral histories and oral traditions, we tend to conceptualize orality and literacy as mutually exclusive, and it, it makes intuitive sense to do so. Um, after all, they're completely different modes of memory preservation and recall, uh, completely different modes of interacting with the past, as described skillfully by the folklorist Herminia Coben, who is based um, in UCLA as well. Um, but we know from fleeting mentions of Spanish accounts of the Caraga Revolt in 1631, as well as from fleeting references in oral traditions um, uh, that there were uh, that they have references to books and writing, and that the presence of one um, of, of of orality in a culture does not preclude um, the presence of literacy in a culture. So there's a lot more to 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 this than 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 maybe we're currently appreciating. 
such details may seem quaint, but to me they add more than just nuance to our understanding of the past. Um, they also add texture that makes it real and humanizes the figures that we study and makes it all so much more interesting to study. Um, I would like to uh, mention a few more examples, uh, and this time focusing on unpacking some very basic concepts that we tend to uh, take for granted and, and erroneously project backwards, sometimes erroneously, often erroneously, project backwards into, into the past. Um, words don't necessarily mean the same thing today that they did in the past, and in translation, of course, it becomes even more problematic. Um, one such concept that is problematic to apply to the past, from to project onto the past from today, is land. When we study Mindanao, land is of course a major issue in Mindanao. Um, so again, with reference to Lumad that I study, uh, despite the territorial autonomy that's uh, sought by indigenous peoples with current legislation, and I'm referring specifically to the IPRA legislation on ancestral domains, those laws, um, their sense of place and territory, and more specifically, their uh, their sense of belonging and identity that, that links up to, the, to these places, can be more accurately traced along river systems and, and um, rate actually radiates out from these rivers, uh, rather than in terms of bounded plots of land as land tenure is conceptualized and enforced today. Okay, so that's not that's true not only of of these uh, culture groups today, although they're forced to to reckon with the Philippine system of land titling, of course, but also how territoriality and how belonging and identity was reckoned in the past. So another problematic uh, concept uh, related, of course, is identity or ethnicity, um, as evidenced in some of the comments yesterday. Um, we know that identity um, and ethnicity can be high, highly problematic to apply. Um, I mean, the modern ideas that we have about ethnicity and um, identity um, can be highly, highly problematic to apply uh, to the past. When we try to apply these modern ideas, um, including the modern um, ethnic groupings and categories to past populations, they don't necessarily harmonize or match up. How people in Mindanao reckoned identity in the past as well as how people in Southeast Asia, wider Southeast Asia, uh, reckoned identity in the past, was quite different to the essentialist manner in which we tend to reckon it in the modern Western context. It was more flexible than it is in the present, where in the present, if you are, for example, a Bisaya or a Bagobo, um, that's not only who you are, but it's also who your ancestors had to have been, as well as who your descendants will be. Okay? Whereas in the past, there was more room for performative and locative constructions of identity um, and ethnicity, including the absorption of captives into new ethnic groups uh, and the existence of populations that, for example, had a cultural and political affinity with the Moros and were even identified by Spaniards as Moros, but who did not identify as Muslim, like the Caragas of the early colonial period. Um, we also have concepts of leadership that can be highly problematic. I'm currently studying the evolution of datuship over time among Higaon and Lumads, and one thing that definitely stands out is that the English translation of the term datu into chief or chieftain does not correspond in any way to the indigenous concept of datuship um, or to mainstream Filipino notions of legitimate political authority for that matter. And again, I can talk at length about this topic if anybody's interested. Um, we have borders and boundaries that are also problematic in terms of how we understand the illicit movement of people and goods in the present. Um, one of my recent PhD students at my former department at the National University of Singapore, um, Vilashini Sumaya, uh, she's Malaysian from Sabah, she studied what she calls irregular migrants from Mindanao and Sulu uh, who are routinely and repeatedly detained uh, and deported over and over again for violating Malaysian borders as they travel to Sabah and individuals such as this travel to Sabah multiple times over a lifetime. It's been a major security issue for uh, Malaysia, to say the least. Um, however, what, what she found was that these migrants did not consider themselves to be transgressive in any way. 
To them, they're not violating any borders or international boundaries. To them, their place of belonging was the water and has always been the water. And in other words, uh, in other words, and to the, the title of um, uh, Vila Samaya's um, dissertation was the sea is their country. Um, and they in fact consider themselves as indigenous to Sabah and the surrounding waters. It is their homeland as such, they are compelled in terms of culture and identity to keep going home, to keep trying to go home. And in their view, it is Malaysia that is transgressive with its artificial modern borders. So you have here as well an eye-opening um, example of indigeneity vis-a-vis -vis an entity, the sea, that probably none of us would associate with the idea of ancestral land. Okay? So there's, there's that as well. We have maritime communities are, are, are just hardly explored um, in their proper context in, in, the, um, in academia to date. Um, and so, and this this idea of the boundaries and borders it also relates in a way to the phenomenon of smuggling, which was mentioned yesterday several times. You know, the movement of goods across borders um, illegally, illicitly. Because, well, okay, ask yourself this: if 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 because if this is how some people view the sea and international borders, what does this mean for our understanding um, of why people do what they do? Uh, just because acts may seem transgressive or dangerous or irrational to us or illegal to us in the modern in modern times, it does not follow that the people performing these acts are being lawless or irrational or illicit even. Um, and last but not least, um, a word about religion in both Christianity and Islam, broadly construed. Um, in a lot of references to such religions as practiced in Mindanao, just over the years I've heard and read, both in the past and in the present, there's been a tendency to label them as syncretistic um, because their practice does not necessarily resemble or match the hegemonic European or Arabic practices of these religions. Um, syncretism in turn, turn has many negative connotations um, of impurity and corruption um, and, and so forth. And I would, I would like to caution against labeling um, or dismissing either the Islamization of Mindanao and Sulu or the Christianization of the same um, as somehow less serious or meaningful than elsewhere in the Philippines, okay? Um, or the region or the world. As I've found in my research on Christian missionization and conversion among Lumads, as well as the work of others on Islam in the Southern Philippines, uh, just because the end result does not look like what you expect or resemble their mainstream forms. It does not follow that these terms of religiosity should be subject to more questioning or doubt than any that of any other population. Again, as with other concepts, the indigenous understanding of their own religious identity and practices should be privileged over the external, supposedly objective understanding of the same. And when we center our research in terms of Mindanao, when we center Mindanao and and the people of Mindanao, okay, this is the, the one of the ways in which we can appreciate it by not talking about how well transgressive these people are, but 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 treating them as legitimate, treating their practices as legitimate, under trying to understand and portray their practices and their cultures as they understand it, okay, as they understand those those practices and cultures, um, so. You know, the, the fact is that when we laugh, we laugh at or frown at the seemingly incongru incongruous or transgressive acts um, or purportedly misguided understandings of people we study. We actually betray our own misunderstanding and perhaps our own chauvinism for expecting others to conform to what we consider proper which in turn is typically limited by our own biographies and our own intellectual genealogies. And so, of course, this is, I sound totally like an anthropologist when I say stuff like that, I know. Um, anyway, so I could go on and on here, but uh, to close, I'd like to make uh, three additional recommendations for future scholarship on Mindanao, separate from the concerns I've already raised. Um, 
first, I'd like to encu encourage scholarship. I'd, I'd like to encourage scholarship, and I'd like us to encourage scholarship by a, di a diverse collection of scholars, especially those from Mindanao itself. There's great value in developing scholars who come from a wide range of perspectives across gender, across religion, um, and from the indigenous minority groups um, among the different Lumads and, and Moro ethnic groups. Um, while the pursuit of excellence in scholarship uh, requires us to transcend our own biographies in our own work, we should also cultivate a true diversity of scholarly, scholarly perspectives um, especially as we grapple with issues of representation and identity and, and, and making, you know, uh, making a narrative and making multiple narratives of Mindanao for the future. Um, you see any such individuals showing an interest in how scholarship is produced, please jump at the chance of training, mentoring, and perhaps sponsoring them in their, in their formation as future scholars of Mindanao. In my own experience in the field, uh, uh, training um, Higaonon Lumads to how, in, in terms of how to write their own oral histories, to produce them as text. Um, it, it, it's so fascinating, I can talk about this um, at length um, as well, because what they're producing now goes beyond what I ever could have conceptualized in terms of what these oral traditions, the forms that these oral traditions could take, and how they could do it, and how they could how they could actually transfer them from oral forms to, to, to um, literate forms. Um, anyway, so I could go on and on about that. Um, it's very exciting for me personally, and so I'd, I'd really encourage you, even the people who you'd, you'd never think, you know, like an, an, an illiterate elder of an indigenous group, you know, is, is totally capable of PhD level discourse and discussion about epistemology. And the production about the production of knowledge, and and this has taught me a lot and helped me grow as a scholar as well. So, and second, um, I would like to caution all of us against politicizing our own work or embedding too much political ideology in our research. Okay, um, and this is not about disregarding our own deeply held religious beliefs or moral convictions as individuals, but a caution against imposing our own political agendas on the people we work with. Um, who may very well have their own ideas and their own needs that don't that don't that we might not even be able to fathom. Worse, if we aren't careful, they will hold us responsible for damage when our agendas fall apart or we otherwise fail them. This is a perpetual complaint among the Lumad communities I've been in, um, not because of me, um, but but. They've had years and years of experiences with scholars, both scholars and NGO types who do scholarly work, to come in and do studies and collect data, cultural data, and then abandon them or otherwise don't fulfill the promises that they've made. Um, it's a delicate balance because we all have our own political convictions, um, but we can also be blinded by them. Prioritizing informed consent and fulfilling our ethical obligations to our informants. Um, as well as privileging the political concerns of these communities that we study rather than our own. Okay? Together, they allow us to avoid unintended damage while at the same time doing good, solid scholarship that will be meaningful and relevant to those communities. Um, finally, recalling a very important point made by Brother Carl Gaspar yesterday morning um, about making our work accessible, to not just other scholars, but specifically to local scholars based in Mindanao. I would like to echo this, and I would like to especially encourage all of us to make sure we return our scholarship to our communities, um, to the communities that helped us produce this scholarship. Of course, this is more relevant to anthropologists um, than, than historians, um, but there are historians who work with living populations as well. So, you know, these are communities that, help, that helped us produce um, the, our scholarship, uh, and we can think of this as a reimbursement for the great con contribution they are making to our individual careers. That's how I've always seen it. Um, for without these communities, without these informants, without the time that they spend with us, and, and the, 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 the extent to which they tolerate our presence in their communities, we would not be able to produce the work. We would not have a livelihood. We would be nothing, okay? We would be nothing. 
Um, so for those who don't work with living populations, there are so many ways to make our work accessible, as uh, Elsa and I were talking about yesterday. Um, and I know I think we should probably talk about this at length. I would like to make a push for providing accessibility to to local Mindanao-based scholars, but not only to them, not only to the local scholars we know, but also to emerging scholars um, and even proto-scholars in high school or early in college. Um, every now and then I get inquiries from such kids through my academia.edu webpage or somebody contacts me randomly on my university email um, asking about this and that, if whether I have any sources, whether I have any references, can I get a copy of my book and that kind of thing, or articles. And, and um, I always accommodate these requests. Uh, and I try to encourage them in their research because you never know where the next groundbreaking ideas will come from. Okay? And you never know what, what, what scholarship this could lead to you know, in the future. So all of these are pathways to centering Mindanao and Mindanaoans in terms of future scholarship. Um, and so uh, I'd like to ad end abruptly here um, and maybe just sort of hope that you have questions. I ended the Higaonon way, which, it, which they just say, Yanda, that's it. Um, so anyway, uh, I hope you have questions. Okay. Everybody awake now. <laughs> assumed he was Filipino, I just... Well, I can't really answer that um, at this point because I, I, it's, I don't address that in my research um, in any way. Um, but that's a good thing to study, I would say. And I mean, just sort of speaking personally, uh, in my, I lived in Davao when I was grade three and four, uh, and my best friend, uh, my mom's best friend's family, um, they were Lebanese Christians. Uh, for those of you from Davao, the ones who own Borgaili store, yeah. Yeah, those are, uh, you know, the daughter was my, my best friend in, 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 um, in elementary school. Um, and yeah, so, so you do have, yeah, that, that's a good thing to point out. I mean, when I was saying Arabs, I was thinking of maybe, um, you know, further back in history and maybe more recent um, migration, uh, specifically of Muslim Arabs. But, but yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, there are many um, narratives of, of Mindanao uh, from different different perspectives, I guess, is, is really the bottom line here. Um. Yes, Georgie. Thanks very much again for the presentation. And my question is very straight to the point. I mean, if, if that really does not feel cheap to the culture, what does it actually mean and what is the understanding of 
Okay, well, <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> lobbing that, that softball at me. Yeah, no, I, um, uh, it's something I'm still grappling to understand. Basically, it's translated, Datu is just translated into the English term chieftain. But the problem lies in how we then use the English term and all the connotations of the English term chieftain from the Western context um, in, and, and apply it to um, the Lumad context. Uh, and so you, you don't have a kind of a centralized power uh, in uh, with Higa Onondatus, you have uh, um, idea an idea of political authority, um, a legitimate political authority that aims for the dispersion of power rather than the centralization of power. And so this is something I'm trying to work on um, and then hopefully produce a book um, in, in a couple of years. But I have an article, um, uh, sorry, a, a chapter in an edited volume um, uh, on... Um, uh, <sighs> I can't even remember what it's called. It's in the description. Uh, it's called Custom and Citizenship in the Philippine Uplands. Um, a title I did not the come The title up. of the book? The title of the book is something Custom about... Custom and Citizenship in the Philippine Islands in... Sorry. Yeah, the title... Citizenship of, and Democratization in Postcolonial Southeast Asia. Yeah. It's a journal. Yeah. No, 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 it's a book. It's a real uh, book. It's a book. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of outlined there what I know so far. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically about the dispersion of power. And so in any given community, like the main community that I've been um, going back to for uh, the last two and a half decades, um, they have, I mean, in any community, you don't have just one datu. You have multiple datus. And you really have a sort of representation of different families and different family lines. And you have ideas that are very Austronesian that you find all over, including in East Timor and elsewhere in Ireland, Southeast Asia, of first families, founding families. And so those from those families who uh, seek to exercise authority or take a leadership role then become Datus or Bais, you know, the women, the, the female um, leaders. and and. Um, you don't really have like a one central chieftain like you do in other um, in in other contexts where you use the word chieftain, and so one way in which that's that's kind of that's really interesting uh, in, in terms of um, the sort of uh, mismatch is when you have uh, the Philippine government telling these communities you have to uh, create a tribal council. And you elect a chieftain and, you know, and, and other officers of the tribal council. This is the form that the government uh, thinks should um, apply to these indigenous communities based on a very kind of westernized understanding of tribal peoples and chieftains. And so what happens then in these communities, in, in, in many Luman communities um, now, is they have the Datus, and then they will pick one or two people to become what they call the Sipdin. Okay, they use their pronunciation of the English term chieftain. They say, oh, this is our, we have a Sipdin. These are the Datus, but we have a Sipdin. And the Sipdin is the one who interacts with the government because the other guys don't want to. Okay, but that's not necessarily the person who leads the community. It's just the person who's on paper as the head of the tribal council. They use the English word siptin. Okay, and then the, the person who manages the ancestral domain, who's in charge uh, administratively, is the chairman or what they call the sirman. It, these are not indigenous concepts or terms. And so that to me kind of really illustrates the, 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 how foreign the idea, English idea of uh, the, the English word chieftain is to, to these particular contexts. Now that might not be the case with other um, communities, with more hierarchical communities, with some uh, moral communities that have more sort of maybe standardized, uh, more familiar uh, forms of political authority. But uh, with Higaonons and other Lumads, it tend to be quite acephalous. It's about the dispersion of power. And of course, that's, that's a paradox in itself. How can you have leadership when the aim is the dispersion of power, not the, not the, not the capture of it? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a paradox, and it's hard to try to, to actually write about it accurately. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead.
Yeah, um, what's what's um, happening now and has been happening for the past couple of decades is that as these communities interact more and more, are forced to interact more and more um, with the Philippine um, governmental uh, apparatus, okay, um, political apparatus with the local government system, um, is that you then start having little kind of um, conflicts uh, internal to these communities about who should really be leading them. And so you have um, uh, this sort of very interesting internal political conflict playing out slowly across the landscape in different communities where ideas about political authority and legitimate political authority are being challenged because you have the indigenous notions of political authority and then you have the sort of Filipino notions of political authority or what's required by the government, what's required um, in, in, in terms of modern citizenship. And, and these people are all very, very keen to exercise their citizen, citizenship and their rights as Filipinos, okay? It's not like they're trying to not be, they're like, no, no, we, damn it, we have rights. And that they see that they're uh, they're um, you know gaining more control over their own lives and their land by asserting their Filipino citizenship. So so they are also eager to interact with the the, the Philippine um, um, uh, government bureaucracy. It's not like they're avoiding it. And so, but that causes little kind of um, shall we say. It, ideas about tradition and ideas about identity are slowly being transformed because they, all of this, the, the political authority, um, modern identity, education, pop culture, religion, a lot of these, these groups are Christian now, evangelical Christian even. Um, there are their ideas about who they are and how, how to be Higaon and how to be indigenous people. Um, they're slowly changing. And um, these ideas are, um, being contested across generations. And so it's, it's, it's something that I'm still trying to parse out. So in addition to those kinds of ideas, you also have ideas about indigenous peoples and indigeneity, the, so, the sort of universalized ideas about what indigenous peop, um, what being indigenous means, also infiltrating these communities in terms of their ideas about themselves and, and ideas about themselves as indigenous peoples in the Philippines. So all of these are all, all kind of Kind of swirling around. I'm still not sure how it's going to, how it's going to to play out. So, I don't know if that made any sense at all. Would there would there be like a collective, uh, like an indigenous term for a, like a collective unit, a useful one we can use, like instead of tribe? They call or, well. They call themselves lumads. Lumad, right? yeah. But, um, um, as far as the groups that I'm directly familiar with, they refer to. For example, with the Higaonons, it's a very uh, large um, population spread out across Misamis, Oriental, Bukidnon, Agusan, Del Sur, and Del Norte. Um, and they refer to themselves as Higaonons, but then their individual communities are what they refer to as their tribu. Do they do say? Yeah, they use the, the English word tribe, tribu, or Tagalog word tribe, uh, tribu. And, um, yeah, so it, it kind of, and, and sometimes they, they, they talk about themselves as indigenous or indigenous, right? But, so this is another kind of area where these, these things kind of don't match up. Um, indigeneity, uh, and I, I just actually published an article in JC's about it, uh, Journal of Southeast Asian Studies. Um, as far as indig indigeneity is concerned um, with Higaonons, their idea of indigeneity has to do with uh, who's a member of the founding families of a particular area. It doesn't have to do with whether you're a Higaonon or not. And so uh, indigeneity is specific to particular communities, not to the tribe as a whole. So if somebody who's a Visayan moves to a particular community, you, they have to get the permission of the um, Ininay Daw Inamay, okay, the, the founding families. If a Higaonon from another community wishes to move to that area, they must also get the permission of the Ininay Dawinamai. And even though a Higaonon person and a Visayan person are quite different to us, okay, one being a member of an indigenous group, another being a settler, okay, 
Um, it could even have like an American, for example, okay, uh, coming in and, and seeking permission to stay in that, in that territory, seek permission from the founding families. But to the founding families, all those people are the same. They are not indigenous to their land. Only the founding families are indigenous. So you have this sort of really different idea about indigeneity as well that clashes with the sort of more universal um, national ideas about you know what's legal definitions of indigenous peoples. So yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and by privileging how people actually understand these things, I think we can, you know, there's so much more we can get out of um, in terms of studying Mindanao. Um, sorry. Oh, about the hair? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Personally, I feel more afraid of violence when I'm in Manila. I always feel like I'm going to get robbed or attacked or something. Um, uh, Mindanao, you can walk around, for me at least, you know, in the sort of so-called rough areas. Um, but, um, yeah, it depends on your perspective. I would say that, just as a personal opinion, as a, based on my own experience, Mindanao is no more violent than the rest of the Philippines. Um, I think that maybe the Philippines could be considered a violent place, but again, it depends on where you're standing and what time period you're talking about, what population you're with, and, and all of that stuff. It's hard to answer that question um, in an objective manner, I think. Uh, there are many different kinds of violence, and what kind of violence are we fearing here? Um, there's, there's violence that we perhaps consider legitimate and don't have a problem with, and there's violence that we consider illegitimate and have a problem with. Um, with regard to, for example, the, the extrajudicial killings, um, now that everybody's all agog about, from the perspective of the upland communities that I've studied, they don't have a problem with it. You know why? Because in from their perspective, we have been getting killed and attacked over the decades and no one said anything about it. No one tried to stop it. We went to Human Rights, the Human Rights Commission, and we were told, no, you go to the police. And we're they're like, well, it's the police that's doing it to us. That's not a human rights issue. So to them, it's like, well, finally, the drug dealers are getting, you know, I mean, of course, if you you kind of dig deeper, they are aware that there are problems with it, you know. Uh, they're not stupid, okay? They can be deep thinkers just like the rest of us. But for them, you know, uh, the, the, they, they have had a problem with violence against their communities for many decades, and no one, in terms of, the, you know, in terms of people in Manila or journalists, or I mean, there's journalists in Mindanao who raised, um, uh, um, uh, who wrote about it and, 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 and raised questions about it and tried to sound the alarm. But as far as people in, in Manila, for example, or the international press, nobody gave a damn about them. And so to them, it's like, no, actually now no one's getting killed in their communities. Okay? No one's getting killed in their communities now, as, as far as the people that I have directly work with. But in the past, you know, there would always be these stories. Oh, did you see who got, you know, the son of this guy got murdered, you know, by somebody driving by in a motorcycle and all that. And, and, and you could argue with them extensively about how this is a problematic human rights issue and extrajudicial killing is wrong. They're like, okay, fine, but as far as our own experience, you know, so this is more, much more complicated. 
it's much more complicated and it's not a perspective that I particularly like or agree with, but I have to appreciate where they're coming from. Yeah, so for them, since Duterte and martial law in Mindanao, Mindanao has become a less violent place for them. But from the outside perspective, Mindanao is, you know, maybe even more violent. So it's, yeah, it just depends on where you're coming from. Depends on where you're coming from. Yeah. Uh, one more question. <laughs> it's okay. Um, sorry. Uh, can we get Midori first? <laughs>